Okay, in this video I'm going to walk you through how I put epoxy on barnwood tables. Um, when, when we're dealing with barnwood tables, there's usually one of two ways that I finish. One is just normal to, normally to put polyurethane on or some type of wax. And in some cases, I suggest that customers use um, epoxy. Epoxy has a number of characteristics that really come in handy um, for places where durability is really something you're going for. So, so the epoxy that you lay down, you end up with like 40 or 50 or 60 layers of polyurethane that's really thick. And if the tab table is damaged, like in a restaurant setting or a setting where you've got lots of kids that like to stab their forks and knives into the table, the epoxy is a whole lot easier to repair than going down and repairing the wood and fixing the stains and stuff like that. So one of the things to be aware of to start off with is that because barn wood is so porous and it's so cracked and has so many holes, this epoxy, when you go put it on, sinks down into everything. And it's not like putting epoxy on top of um, metal or on top of wood that's already pre-finished that has no holes and cracks in it. So you're gonna end up with a lot of air bubbles and a lot of issues. And that could cause a lot of problems when you just try and do a flood coat all at once. So I always do it in multiple stages, somewhere between two and three stages, depending on how the wood goes. So this is a um, tabletop that I worked on. I have a video of how we went through and did this. This is a square table that we did rabbit edge cut, rabbit uh, cuts around the whole outside. And we've got um, plywood on the inside. So we've got the thin planks on the top. We've got the rabbit cuts on the outside. That gives me some really nice live edge um, barnwood on the outside and uh, a solid wood looking table. One of the benefits of that is now, because I've resawn all this wood and I have the thin planks and the plywood underneath, I've really limited the amount or the volume that these cavities in the boards where the holes are um, will take in terms of, of, of the wood. When you have full two by fours or two by sixes or two by eights or anything bigger than that, you really don't know how much epoxy those, those cracks are going to take. And as a result, you might have to do several layers of epoxy and you might spend a whole lot more money on epoxy because you're just filling those voids. And it's nice, it's going down and stabilizing the wood. But in this case, we're really limiting the amount that it can do that. The only uncertainty is in that quarter inch of veneer that I have. Um, and even then, because we've seen the bottom side and we can see the top side, we're gonna use way less epoxy and have way, way less uh, issues to deal with. So the first step uh, on this one is I'm gonna rough sand the whole thing, get it all nice and flat. Um, and obviously expose some of the barnwood character or, or amplify the barnwood character. Then I'm gonna flood coat the whole thing with the black stuff like I always do. I won't go over that in detail this time. Um, in quite a few of the videos I've already done, you can go back and review that. Then I'm going to put a stain on this one because they want some color on it or I want some color on it before it goes to the trade show. And then we're gonna put the first coat of epoxy on. So I'll get to work doing that and then um, we'll, we'll get on to the epoxy. Okay, the Woodwise patch filler is on. It's dry. I've got a link in the description down below if you want to use this stuff. It's super handy for leveling out all your cracks and saw marks and anything that's low, plugging any holes prior to putting our stain and our uh, epoxy finish on. I know what you're all thinking, Dusty. What's up with the super cool black and, uh, black and red glove you got on? You trying to be like Michael Jackson or what? No, I hurt my finger and I'm trying to cover it up. So I don't know why I'm not putting both on, but I'm not. Anyways. Uh, 150 grit sandpaper, we're going to smooth this down nice and even. Okay, now it's time to mix and pour some epoxy. This time I'm using uh, East Coast Resin, this tabletop uh, epoxy hardener. I got this stuff off of Amazon, I'll put a link in the description down below so you can grab some too. Uh, if you want or get any other epoxy. Um, I've tried quite a few of them. Um, some of them are a little bit more fickle than others and they're all kind of weird to work with. They're sloppy and messy and temperamental and fickle but they they do have some really good characteristics so it's kind of worth dealing with all the, the crap they have to go through. First thing that we want to do is we're going to do a seal coat and then we do a flood coat afterwards especially with barnwood because it's so porous and there's so many holes and cracks and stuff to fill and even though I, I flood coated this with the black uh, filler and I've sanded it all off, there still you know, might be a little pinhole here or there and this stuff will just leak down inside of it. And so rarely uh, have I been able to get a, a good finish on, on like just one coat. So I do a seal coat, which either I just scrape on or brush on. That goes in and sets and then I'll come back and do a flood coat afterwards. Sometimes there's been occasions where um, there's been a void and a little hole and a lot of the epoxy has gone down into it and I'll come and just fill that one, then sand that and then do the flood coat afterwards. 
Um, the, the things you really want to pay attention for, I've actually already poured in um, the part of it. So these, most of them are a one-to-one -one ratio. So you really want to make sure you mix them one-to-one. -one. They, are, they are very picky when it comes to that type of stuff. So I've got these buckets that, that um, have the measurements on the side and I kind of hold the bottles up to each other too, just for an extra thing, just to see where, you know, how they are in relation to each other just in case the, the bucket was a little weird or something like that. And then these ones, they, the, the manufacturers, every one that I've used all have different like recommendations. Some of them say mix for one minute and then mix for two, mix for two and then put it in a bucket and another bucket and then mix there in two minutes, some take six, some take seven. Some, some say, I can't talk. Um, what, what I look for is when you mix the two together, they start to look a little cloudy and sort of stringy and sometimes silvery. I just keep mixing until it's clear. Like that's how you know that it's, that it's mixed. So that might be a few minutes or it might be more. Another thing you wanna do is as you're mixing, make sure, like I use a pretty big stick, but I, and I make sure it's clean, it's got nothing on it. And make sure that you scrape the sides of it off and then, and then periodically make sure you're scraping off the very edge of the bucket all the way around. And I use like nice sharp edges on the corners and a flat bucket. So when I go and mix, I pull everything off the corners and I make sure to pull it off the bottom too. Cause the stuff gets like, it'll get sticky. Anything unmixed won't cure. It'll be tacky and sticky and you'll have one spot in the, one part of your table that hasn't set up and you got to cut it out afterwards and refill it. So this is probably the most important step, accurate measurement and really thorough mixing. And you can see, like, I'm not even using a timer. I'm just going to keep mixing until I hold this stuff up and it's not cloudy at all. It's just clear and I can see right through the bottom. You can use for big pours, um, like a, a, a drill with a mixer on the end. Just be very careful not to whip it like whip, whipped cream, you know. What happens is you put a ton of bubbles into it and you're going to get some bubbles no matter what when you're mixing. But when you whip it, it just makes billions of tiny little bubbles and those are almost impossible to get out afterwards, especially if you've got a, like a thicker pour. So for, for this first, especially this is kind of a smaller table, and for this first pour, I'm gonna do it by um, hand. And you can see I'm trying to get all the way around the edges here. I'm gonna, I mean, I might do this three or four or five times throughout the, the deal. Scrape off the edge. <clears throat> and keep mixing. Don't, again, don't whip it, you know, like try, try and limit the amount of air that's getting inside of this. One of these days I actually want to build or buy a, um, like a, I don't know what they call them, like a decompression or a vacuum chamber and you can set this in the vacuum chamber afterwards and it sucks all the air out and then you have zero bubbles in it whatsoever. I just haven't got around to it yet and so I use a torch. So now it's starting to look really good. I'm just going to keep going to be safe. You can use a plastic. You, I've used a brush before. Just make sure it's a, a brush where the bristles don't fall out that much or you get bristles stuck in your epoxy. You can use a plastic one or a metal one as well. I'm going to pour in the middle of the table. <clears throat> Little piece of dust on there. Um, and then I sort of, like it's, it's self-leveling. And so you, you pour it on and kind of let it do its own thing. I'll start in the middle and then sort of help it spread out. And then around the edges, that's one of the reasons I wear these gloves as well, is as it gets to the edge, I, I use my hand to push it over the edge and sort of rub it in and push it into any cracks that may be on the outside. Um, and, and then just let it, let it level, let it, let it do its thing. I've checked this to make sure that the table itself is level where it's sitting right now. I've put some uh, it's brown paper underneath so it'll catch any of the the epoxy it drips over the edge and it is going to make a mess it is going to drip over the edge it is going to cause um, a little bit of a mess so if you're doing this inside on a pre-built unit and stuff like that make sure you you know tarp everything off or put plastic on the floor um, after we've got it on and it's been dripping for a while i'll use my glove and come along and sort of um, rub off some of the the uh, little drips that are forming on the edge on the bottom side and if you catch it at the right time you can actually come with a knife after and cut those off before it fully cures or just flip it over when it's done and sand them down, um, depending on when, when you catch it or not. So I'm just making sure there's no dirt and dust down here. And then we will pour this stuff on. 
this is actually way more than I need for this first seal coat. But it's on now. Okay, now I'm just gonna kinda like do the best I can. You can see this is laid down in the middle and I'm just gonna kinda help it. You can sort of see it like making its way out and I'm just gonna try and help it a little bit to work its way to the outside. This first seal coat is just like, it's just going on to make sure that all the cracks and holes were filled um, and that the epoxy isn't trying to escape somewhere. You can see I've got all these ridges. So I'm just gonna kind of go over back and forth and try and level out, give it a little bit of a help, level out any of those ridges that I left as I was doing that. So now from there, it's pretty much gonna do its job of, of leveling by itself. And all I need to do now is go around these edges. So I'm gonna use my glove, and I'm just gonna come around the edge and kind of steal some off the side and rub it along. A lot of, a lot, there's a lot of a lot kind of dripping over the side, so you really only need to grab some and push it into the sides where there's not stuff dripping over already. Now there's some air bubbles in this from when I was mixing it, and there's some air bubbles forming from where the epoxy is going down into whatever hole there is, and it's replacing that hole, the air in that hole, with epoxy, and it's pushing the air back out. And so bubbles are starting to come to the surface. We're gonna let this set just for a second here, let it kind of level out a little bit. Oh, there's something there. There we go. So we'll let this kind of level out, let some bubbles kind of come out a little bit, and then uh, do the torch a little bit on it. Like I say, we'll let it sit for a second, let it kind of level out, and then we'll pop some of these bubbles. Shouldn't be too many. If you don't do the step with the, the black filler, then there's usually a lot more bubbles and a lot more voids to fill and, and issues you have. So this, flood, this seal coat becomes way more important um, in that scenario. Okay, now to pop these bubbles, I'm gonna use this um, torch, this uh, pro propane torch. You can use an air dryer, um, you can use a heat gun, and you can even breathe on it yourself. Um, those ones, though, will kind of move air around, and if there's dust in your shop, then you're kind of blowing the dust around, and so the flame is, is, uh, does the job, it seems, without, without you know, disturbing dust or blowing stuff around or anything like that. And, and we're not trying to heat the epoxy. Um, we're like six to 10 inches above, and I'm not a scientist, but from what I understand, what you're trying to do is create a deficit of oxygen in the area above the bubble. And because the bubble, the oxygen uh, to carbon dioxide ratio inside the bubble wants to be equal to that outside the bubble, that's what pops the bubble, is just that idea of trying to equalize pressure on both sides. So you're burning oxygen to make the bubbles want to pop. And you're not going on, on top of it. So I don't even know if you can see in the camera the bubbles that are popping, but this is really all, this is really all we're doing. It's just kind of passing over it. And uh, hopefully you guys can see that the bubbles are popping. But maybe you can. And the bigger the void is that the epoxy is trying to get into, the more, the more bubbles will come out of it. And they'll come out of it just for quite a while, like for the next half hour or so. So I always will do this at a time, usually at the end of the day. Um, and then I can let it set up overnight. But I can sit and watch it for a while until, until I'm happy with it. It's um, kind of like concrete in that way where it sort of tells you how long to work. So yeah, uh, that is basically how we start off the first part of the epoxy pour, is this nice seal coat. And I'll just keep an eye on it and I can see even right now how some of the little cracks in this wood are taking some more of the epoxy than other spots. But because it's sort of still in its self-leveling phase, as the epoxy goes down into those holes, more epoxy from around is kind of trying to fill. And depending on how deep that crevice is, um, it'll either get to a point where it continues to fill and then the epoxy sets up and you've got a little, a little divot there, which is why we come back and do the flood coat uh, the next time. And then we know we have a perfect um, flat surface. So not too complex. There's just a few things you've got to pay really close attention to to make sure you've got your mixture right. And, uh, you, and 
the, the ratio right and the, and the mixing right, and then it's got a lot of positive characteristics that are good for areas where you need a durable table. So uh, next thing we'll do is come back and sand this, and then uh, we'll let it set up, come back and sand it, and we'll put one more flood coat on. And then because it's so glossy, and I don't like the glossy furniture for the reclaimed type of stuff that I do, I sand all the gloss off, and then I actually put a satin polyurethane on top, and that way we get a satin finish, but we get the benefits of the uh, durability of the epoxy and the self-leveling of the epoxy. Okay, really quick. I've been here about half an hour now, just watching for bubbles and blowing them all out with the torch. And it's leveled out really nice. It's looking really good. There's a few spots, and this is kind of normal where it, you know, there's a couple cracks and stuff like that where it's soaking up kind of more than there is in the available area around. Um, but that's totally fine. That's what this that's what this first seal coat's for is to find some of those to get most of it kind of all plugged off real nice. And then when we come back and sand and pour our next coat, we know where we can give a little bit of extra attention and detail and make sure that they're nice and filled up. And then our next coat should go on nice and smooth.